and we will go ahead and uh, kick off the guerrilla marketing webinar, um, winning with non-traditional marketing channels. Just to quickly introduce uh, the presenters. My name is Dustin Cedarholm. I'm the digital conversion manager for Fluid. Um, I've been doing conversion uh, testing and uh, implementation for almost seven years now and uh, I've been able to turn many different company sites from just pretty uh, brochure type landing pages into convertible landing pages and that's sort of the expertise that, that I hold. Um, I'll introduce Phil Case, our Managing Director and Partner at Fluid. Um, Phil, do you want to give a quick background on yourself? You know, I've uh, focused a lot of my, uh, my past several years at Fluid. I've been there for about seven years now, but trying to help companies grow and uh, I'm excited about today's topic because we often talk about some of the more conventional ways uh, through, you know, building out a website or doing digital marketing or doing billboard or radio advertising. But this topic's of a particular interest because our agency is focused on no matter what we do, we want to make sure that uh, any um, tactic is ultimately uh, strate strategically focused on revenue, lead generation growth, e-commerce growth, and so I'm excited uh, for today's discussion and just being able to kind of a little bit turn our focus to uh, maybe some other marketing channels that can be more fun but aren't as popular. Fantastic, and I would agree. And then I want to give a uh, special welcome to our co-host and presenter of today's webinar, uh, John Dye, the uh, digital, or excuse me, director of digital media at Boncom. Welcome, John. Thanks, Dustin. Yeah, just to introduce myself briefly, I uh, currently with Bonneville Communications, and and we focus mainly in the nonprofit sector. So, I hope I can bring a little bit of uh, expertise and assistance in that area as we talk about some of these tactics today. I love the non-traditional approach, as does Phil, of what we'll be talking about today. And I think these are some of the most creative and most fun tactics that you can you can do under any strategy or uh, to fulfill any objective. So I'm excited about it. We're excited to have you, and I know we have a few nonprofits uh, in attendance, and so hopefully they'll get some good value from a true expert. Uh, thanks for coming again. Um, just for everybody out there, if you guys want to uh, tweet to us, our Twitter handles are below our profiles there, or if you'd like, uh, you can Follow along with the hashtag Fluid Webinar Series, or again, any of our uh, direct message at Get Fluid and at uh, Dijo. Um, we'll go ahead and just jump into it then. I will actually say before we move on that today we've done something special where we actually picked three of the people who would be in attendance today, and we have some guerrilla marketing tactics we'd like to uh, suggest directly to them. And so for everybody that is attending now, uh, st stick around with us and maybe at the end we're going to be giving you some uh, freebie information on your company specifically. So everybody stick around and uh, we'll go ahead and get into it. Just to quickly define guerrilla marketing, guerrilla marketing got its name from uh, guerrilla um, guerrilla armies and guerrilla tactics, guerrilla militias, uh, most similarly to the Revolutionary War and how the United States was able to defeat uh, the much larger Great Britain in, um, by using some unconventional tactics. And so uh, in 1980, um, J. Conrad Levinston actually coined the term guerrilla marketing and uh, his quote here is that guerrilla marketing is achieving conventional goals such as profits and joys with unconventional methods such as investing energy instead of money. So basically in a nutshell, guerrilla marketing is a very inexpensive way to produce really exciting results, those unique results that aren't always tied to just you know, direct conversions but have a fun and newsworthy um, piece to them. Um, John, do you want to speak to uh, how, how you define guerrilla marketing within your group and um, just in general what, what you would uh, describe it to uh, the, our audience? 
You betcha. You betcha. The point that I think actually is most poignant on this slide is at the very bottom. We all know that marketing can fit into three big buckets. You've got your earned media, your own media, and your paid media. Paid, those are the traditional channels, whether they be television, print, um, broadcast of any sort like radio, things like that. Owned, anything that you own that, uh, you know, your social media properties, your website, things like that. But earned media, I think this is where you get the most exposure because you do something noteworthy enough that um, other channels want to pick you up and talk about you. And so I think it's most important to do some things that are unconventional. We'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, but something unconventional, something that's noteworthy, that's eye-popping, that gets people really involved and wants them to share that content on their channel. So if you're picked up by BuzzFeed or Mashable or any other large outlet, it could be a local broadcast distribution channel, anything like that. That is where I think um, guerrilla marketing fits, and that's why I think it's so important that people think about this, um, that really you put a lot of creativity into it, but from a low-budget perspective, as it says here on the slide, uh, you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of money per se, but because of the high exposure that you get from the earned media due to the originality of whatever you're doing, I think that's where the, the, the real crux of guerrilla marketing comes into effect. I absolutely agree, and I think one of the interesting things in doing research for this webinar, I came across a lot of projects that were popping up that were actually launched in 2008. Um, so it just really speaks to the longevity and the lasting impression uh, these kinds of activities have on people. Correct. One other thing, though, I'd mention really quick is there, there is a certain amount of risk that is inherent in any marketing, but I'd say more so in guerrilla marketing than others. We'll see some of the things that didn't work as we go through the deck today, but um, just know that depending on what your, um, your emphasis is and what your goal is and some of the things that you want to accomplish through this tactic, there may be better ways to do it, but when you can find something that fits perfectly in this niche of marketing, it really, you can hit the, the ball out of the park for sure. And I'll say as well, it typically fits well into a, you know, kind of a integrated approach when you're trying to launch a major product or having a specific event or do something that you really want to get attention. It may not be as sustainable as other marketing channels, but it's one of more of those where you're trying to leave a lasting impression of doing something differently. Guerrilla marketing sometimes isn't as something you can replicate the same type of thing, uh, you know, day after day, but it's uh, it's nice for those bigger pushes, promotions, unveilings, uh, new locations, et cetera. Absolutely. Let's go uh, just talk briefly about what guerrilla marketing is not. Um, guerrilla marketing in the traditional sense uh, is not print or TV advertising. Um, pretty much this is stuff that's out on the streets, it's um, something that you're more interactive with, mm. it's uh, not the traditional method and that's really what makes it so unique. Um, have you guys seen anything that uh, directly stands out that is not guerrilla marketing? Yeah, I would, I, I think you were pretty succinct there, I think anything that you when, when you think of traditional marketing, any way that you can normally get that broadcast message out, um, I, I don't think of those as guerrilla type tactics. Now, what's interesting though is because it does fall within earned media, a lot of those traditional broadcast mediums that pick you up for no cost are, are the ones that really get your message out. So really it's doing an, uh, an end around. I guess you, you could say traditional marketing from a pay perspective, you still show up in those channels but the way that you show up on those channels is because you're doing something new or noteworthy enough that they want to talk about you. You're not paying them to talk about you. Yeah, I think that kind of leads into that quote down below um, by uh, Drew Nacer, uh, CEO of Renegade Marketing. Uh, I think guerrilla marketing really is a state of mind. And even when you kind of think traditional, to your point, John, if you can just twist it a little bit, you can throw in a little bit of the guerrilla aspect of it, and then people start to take notice in a little bit different way. Yeah, as we, as we talk about some of the tactics a little bit later in, in the slide deck, we'll, t we'll talk about how you take something that's um, traditional or something that you see every day, and you just put that slight twist on it, 
which makes you see it or the, the audience see it with new eyes. And that's really where the, the power is, is taking something that, you know, again, you see every day, adding a little twist, a little flair, which makes them remember that in a, in a new way. I think that's what makes this all so exciting to talk about, really. Let's get into, uh, just quickly, who uses guerrilla marketing? Mm -hmm. John, is it everybody that can use guerrilla marketing? Well, everyone can to some extent. You, you've got to um, think through, again, what you're, what you're trying to do, the core objective of, of the campaign and things like that. You can definitely employ certain guerrilla marketing tactics, but as I said earlier, you, you do have to be careful with, especially with financial uh, institutions, insurance type institutions. Some of, some of those things, it can actually A, either backfire on you, or B, um, it's absolutely not allowed because they are regulated. And so you just have to be careful, depending on where your, your niche is and what you're doing, make sure that you go through the due process to make sure that what you're doing is allowable or uh, you could dig a pretty deep hole for yourself. But, yeah, you can use them in all the industries you see up on your screen right now. I mean, everyone that utilizes guerrilla marketing touches the consumer in some way. So you can – it's pretty much the breadth and depth of all, all industries. Absolutely. And so just on this slide, guys, we've put up a few of the popular industries. This is by no means an exhaustive list. And to John's point again, um, you know, you can probably work it into most anything, but uh, be careful in some different areas. And, and let me just speak to this. I mean, even with car companies, I mean, there's there's some interesting, and in whether you call this guerrilla marketing or just more of a um, leveraging technology in three dimensions and virtual reality, but uh, being able to give the user a more immersive experience. And so in a fairly... Uh, you know, well-known building in a metropolis, Lexus launched one of their new cars a couple of years ago, and they actually took a building and with 3D image mapping were able to have it look like there was a Lexus, you know, kind of on its side, being able to drive up and down this building and do some remarkable things. And, and it was a little bit more of the untraditional using more of the environment. But be, as you consider technology with guerrilla marketing tactics, you can often – create a more even unique brand experience. So people may not physically be at your location, but what type of experience are you trying to communicate to them? And I think that uh, if done well, can even uh, you know be a, a major differentiator uh, in that regard. Phil, Phil I love that. Um, Insurgent, the movie that just came out recently, actually utilized Google Cardboard. For those that might not be familiar with uh, Google Cardboard, it's a, it's kind of a virtual reality, very immersive type um, uh, tactic that you can utilize just utilizing your standard phone, your iPhone or your, your Android phone. They actually created an app in conjunction with Google Cardboard, sent the Google Cardboard, which was nicely wrapped, obviously, in insurgent type branding. Um, the app was free to download, so they would send this around to these um, media conglomerates around the nation. And um, again, this was, I, I'd say, fairly fairly cheap in comparison to doing some of the more traditional marketing. You could just blast your message out via TV, via radio, via print. They did this, though, which actually brought them a lot of, of news that they got free of charge just because of the fact that people were, A, more familiar with it, B, they did it in a new and unique way. C, they utilized technology, and it was a very immersive experience. So very, very good way to think outside the box and really do something that was memorable. I agree. And even okay, just good example. Looking at these two examples, I don't know if uh, our attendees can see that too well, but in the pictures it says that in 89 countries, walking on a mine is still routine, and then it's a little ketchup packet. I, I don't know what it is. I just... This stuff uh, is so creative, and, and I love it so much. Um, there's just so many great ideas. Let's go uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, B2B versus B2C in the guerrilla marketing world. I know there's um, some people who kind of lean towards one side more than the other. Uh, John, what do you feel? Do you believe uh, it can do work for both or one, or how do you feel? You know, I, I think there are applications definitely for both. We we do see, I think, more the more memorable examples that we see are in the B2C arena. 
Um, some of the, the better B2B examples, though, that I've seen are ones where, especially uh, smaller type companies, that instead of buying, you know, postcards or a mass mailer that they can send out to tens of thousands of companies, if they go through their client list or their desired client list and they say, let's just take the top 100, which, again, for a lot of us, if we were able to land the top 100 of, of a list of thousands, we'd be very happy. Um, they say, instead of doing this mass mailing and kind of taking a shotgun approach, let's do something that really makes us memorable and stands out in their mind. And They'll often do a three-dimensional mailer of some sort. For example, a marketing company that I'm familiar with, they actually took an oar or a paddle from a canoe or rowboat or something, and they would send that to, again, these high-level people that are on their, uh, their wish list for clients. And, of course, when you receive something in the mail, the immediate thing that you want to do is open it up and figure out what's in it, right? It's like Christmas morning, so let's figure this out. So that really helps cement that company's name into that person's mind. So as they follow up and they start doing some things, that at least buy the, buys them usually a 10-minute conversation with that individual to talk about that marketing tactic or that marketing approach, which, again, gives that leverage uh, to get into that door a little bit. So B2B, I've seen it uh, utilized well in some ways, but I think, again, the more memorable, memorable examples that we'll talk about today are probably more B2C. Well, and on that note, John, you know, there's a, a client that we uh, worked with here locally uh, that uh, it was very much a B2B play, and they – uh, we're trying to get in front of a very specific niche audience that they knew that audience fairly well and what they would respond to. And so, uh, you know, we uh, we created uh, this wooden toolbox that out of that, uh, with, you know, high-end craftsman tools and wrenches, began to send one piece at a time. And so it was almost a little bit of a, uh, you know, trying to get their attention, but week after week began to send messaging and content uh, to the point where every one of the uh, – the recipients of those gifts um, said, you know, we're very interested. You have our attention. Come in and, you know, we'd love to have you present. And by the way, bring your full gift or toolbox. And so you're, you're right, leveraging that in the B2B sense where you can still go untraditional, but it can be very specific. It doesn't just have to be mass audiences. Absolutely. And we'll actually see another example of that as we go through the deck here. I'm going to move us along just for time's sake. Um, how about big versus small, Phil? What do you think? You know, it's interesting. I, uh, you, you, I mean, we'll have some examples here of you know such companies as McDonald's, and so um, often you see smaller companies that are a little bit more nimble, agile, and to John's point, with less lawyers and attorneys, and don't have as big a targets on their back for being sued. And so sometimes you see smaller companies uh, typically uh, will engage in that just to compete with the. The big, and even if you think of guerrilla warfare, one of the reasons the U.S. struggled so much in Vietnam is because it wasn't that uh, there was large, you know, well-disciplined armies and the hundreds of thousands coming out in droves against the uh, Americans and other forces, but in guerrilla mar guerrilla warfare, uh, they were more agile, more nimble. They were kind of the underdogs, and so you'll see sometimes smaller companies as the underdogs trying to kind of leg up and uh, compete with much bigger marketing budgets, but do it in a way that uh, can draw attention and be effective. And so, you know, as we talked about, a lot of these activities aren't per se sustainable in and of themselves, but always thinking with this mindset, that state of mind, and always trying to be out of the box and creative is really, I think, the most important takeaway in that whether you're a large or a small company, uh, you can still engage with that. You could be release, releasing a movie and still create this immersive experience that uh, you know, we consider more on the guerrilla marketing side. Absolutely. John, did you have anything to add? No, I think uh, Phil brought, brought that point home. But I just want to point out the picture here I think is fantastic. It's a little mouse uh, hole that they created, and it goes under the door, and then when somebody comes home, they have to pull it out, and it's an ad for a uh, extermination company. So um, just really fun things that people do. Um, so let's get into the nitty-gritty, how-to guerrilla marketing. So I'd love to cover some of these steps as well, but, you know, if, you, if you're considering about this, you know, guerrilla marketing should just be a haphazard effort. 
uh, it needs to be specifically thinking through what is our objectives and ultimately it should relate to how will we grow our business. And that's why the B2C often will work well. Uh, but that idea of purchasing something, you know, supporting costs, changing behavior, shifting paradigms. Absolutely. And, John, I think you've set up uh, more than one or two of these in your day. You, and, wanna... uh, you don't want to just have these uh, type of activities just in the wild, so to speak, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, these unconventional kind of tactics, you know, stray too much. And so beginning with the firm objective, I think, is fairly key. Yeah, I totally, totally agree, Phil. I think, uh, you know, to your point just a little bit earlier, uh, guerrilla warfare tactics, even though they may seem a little bit um, just off the cuff or, you know, non-traditional in some ways, you've got to start with the end in mind here. You've got to determine what your core objectives are, just like those guerrilla marketing or, excuse me, those guerrilla warfare tactics were to take out certain platoons or certain maybe um, – uh, wings of individuals so that larger contingents could come against, uh, you know, their foes and, and have an easier way to go about it. You've got to start with the end in mind, have the core objective of your advertising campaign in mind, and not just do these off the cuff, just not one off. Or you've got to know what you want that to do, that piece of your, your marketing campaign. Also, the target demographic, our second point here. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times where people didn't know who they wanted to talk to specifically or how they should talk to them appropriately. If you don't know all of these things, gender, age, ethnicity, education, occupation, where they live, their residence or their type of residence, their religion, social status, etc. If you don't know those things and how they will react to certain ways that they see things, like you said, in the wild or guerrilla marketing tactics, you could be setting yourself up for failure as well. So make sure you know not only what you want to do, but who you want to speak to. And that goes, uh, again, we're talking marketing 101 here. So I think what we're saying here is even though guerrilla seems like it can be a little bit on the edge, and it should be on the edge to get the attention, you've got to have it be larger, uh, a piece of a larger campaign to really be effective. And that, you know, kind of lending to step three is to say, now that you know who you're after and what might resonate with them, you do have to ultimately tie it back to your product brand or services. And so the ideas, idea is that conceptual. It's trying to say, you know, you do need to tie it back to the business, you know, just like that little mouse hole example. Uh, what, what's something clever, interesting, unique, different? And so just being able to kind of do a brainstorm idea session, uh, an ideation with a management team or, uh, others in the marketing department to say what will stand out, what will uh, be different, and uh, begin to kind of think about uh, what's going to get people's attention. Right, I think I, I think that's huge. Yeah, that um, the, the in the sessions I've been in, you not only understand what you're trying to do, who you're trying to speak to, but then yeah, we just start with the brainstorming session of, um, as it says here, images, ideas that we associate with that. Um, and then from there, that comes with uh, alternative concepts and scenarios that could convey your concept. Usually when you think of those core ideas and images and things that, that you associate with that concept, that gives you then the ability to think, you know, one step removed or two steps removed, which eventually kind of comes full circle when it makes sense what you're trying to do. So that's, that's a, a great way to, to do that. And I think this, as I look at this, though, the outlets that will pitch your message, because sometimes when you start with guerrilla marketing, you actually say, I really want to be picked up by X, Y, or Z company, or be broadcast via radio or television, or I want to make sure I get the, the attention of this outlet to make sure that they cover us. And when you think through that, you can go through often and see what they've picked up in the past and how they've approach those things and whatnot. And so I, I've even seen some people hire, and you have to be careful doing this, but hire PR firms so that right after something is done, then they start pitching it or bringing it to certain people's attention. And uh, when you do that, obviously your, your ratio for, su for success goes up greatly. And, and as far as this experimentation, I, I would say one of the best things you can do is uh, just begin to test the idea so as you come up with a concept or 
whatever type of scenario you're wanting to do, start to talk to those in the office about it. Start, you know, talk to your spouses and friends and just to get some, you know, consensus around this. If people do think, I mean, before you, even with guerrilla marketing can cost a little bit of dollars, I think it's worth, um, you know, vetting that much as usual without the kind of a full-on campaign and spend out many alternatives or other conceptual type ideas that could work just as well or even better than the original thought. Yeah. One more point I'll make on this, uh, Phil, really quick is um, I think it's good to think through the best-case scenario, and I'm always one that likes to, to be careful, though. You've heard that in some of my comments already. But think of the worst-case scenario as well, and think of um, how you could still utilize that and spin that in such a way that it will bring, um, you know, good light potentially on the brand. I remember – uh, at the University of Utah, and this was a few years ago, I think it was Planned Parenthood who did uh, some things with contraception up at, up at the University of Utah. And the way that that was received, uh, they were not ready for the backlash that they received, the way that they handled that guerrilla marketing tactic. A, it was very, uh, I think, well done, but B, it wasn't well thought out because all of the news channels picked it up print uh, magazines, you know, newspapers, they all talked about this in the way that it was carried out, and they weren't ready with a way to um, answer some of those questions. And because of that, it, it was really a black eye on the company. But again, if done effectively, and if you think through the scenarios, this can be a very, very effective tactic. Absolutely. And I think we, uh, there's a couple of those that will address the, the right ways to do it, and then maybe some of the um, ways that they turned into a positive that started out negative. And so let's move slides and uh, we'll speak a little more directly to some of those examples. Um, just real quickly, uh, the guerrilla marketing tactics are actually classified into five different groups. Some people will classify these into their own marketing channels, uh, but you also see them bundled within Gorilla. And so we just wanted to list those and give everybody kind of an idea of some of the different opportunities uh, and ways of using it. Um, they're, they're just some of the funnest things as far as ambient, uh, the way people have used their environment, um, people turning trees into completely different products. There's a really great uh, one of Paul Bunyan, and they have put Paul Bunyan's body through the tree. Um, just, just some really great ways to, to almost do augmented reality in a way, but uh, on a very small budget. Um, I won't go through each of those. Um, probably some of the more familiar ones that you guys see on a day-to-day -day regarding guerrilla marketing would be viral and street. Um, street with the uh, flash mobs and some of the product animations are some of the ones that really get a lot of news uh, press and often will show up on your news channels um, due to just the video aspect of it. But So these are kind of just the different categories that uh, guerrilla marketing tactics exist in and we wanted to give you guys uh, that introduction. Feel free to kind of research those on your own as you go. We'll talk to how some companies have used these tactics in our next couple slides. So I want to first talk about this McDonald's uh, study here. So this is actually done in Canada, and as you can see, kind of the focus uh, beginning to introduce their $1 drink campaigns, and based on where you live in the U.S., uh, or, or I, I think that uh, McDonald's has done a fairly effective job, a lot of billboard advertising, uh, and traditional means that uh, they've gone about, but it's interesting. This was one that uh, I think they wanted to bring it home a little bit more. So this was in uh, Alberta uh, that uh, that they did this, and uh, they well, you can go to the next slide, Dustin. But they essentially, you know, number one, as we go through these steps, they wanted to increase drink purchases. You know, with this one dollar drinks was simply a gimmick, of course, to get people into the actual locations. Um, with the demographic, you know, specific Canadian cities, that, you know, this was launched originally in Alberta, so keeping that in mind and kind of the, you know, the, the stores or the restaurants in those areas. Uh, from an imagery perspective, uh, they wanted to uh, really say, how do we get people to pick this up from a news perspective uh, on their Canadian YouTube channel, blog, social, et cetera. So they looked at those outlets to say, what do we control as McDonald's and what type of meetings do we want this to proliferate through. And so they began with their own, um, you know, from an imagery perspective to say, how do we uh, really promote 
uh, the brand on these channels that will then kind of springboard to others and ultimately drive drink per purchases. Uh, some of the alternative concepts is, of course, do this in American cities, and they have done this in some as well, and uh, or, or some sort of paid event that people can come to. But what they did from an outlet perspective in that visual that Dustin showed is that, you know, they essentially took a giant block of ice and they constructed that giant M that we're all familiar with, the Golden Arches, and uh, those those 4,000 Canadian dollars that they actually had in coins, it took about five hours. And uh, as people chipped away at the blocks, I mean, as people began to find, discover it, I mean, there were dozens and dozens and hordes of people that began to gather around, everybody trying to get their dollar. And, um, you know, it was interesting to kind of see the reaction. And I, th I think there was a lot of not only positive publicity, but just a good experience that people had with that. And, uh, of course, what's interesting, you know, those 4,000 engagements uh, that they had directly and touches with the brand in a very positive way. I mean, where do you think they probably took those, you know, dollar coins? I, I'm sure they went directly to McDonald's and spent it on a new drink. And so it's almost that any dollar they gave out, they reinvested back in them, into them, their own brand. But, you know, 65,000 YouTube views fairly initially on, you know, citywide media coverage in Alberta. And so it was a fairly effective campaign as, you know, as we talked through each of those steps of being able to see a direct impact, uh, look at a kind of a microcosm of a population in a specific city, and ultimately, though, get some virality out of that, you know, through the web, YouTube, et cetera, to uh, expand beyond that. So I, I love this example because it, it does highlight those three points, low budget, you know, $4,000, you're, you're, you're talking some sunk costs into people's time to think through it and to actually create this, but literally just 4000 out of pocket, right? And then whatever those other sunk costs are. The high impact, originality, it's definitely there. High exposure, you get all of that. And in today's, um, you know, social media world, again, 65,000 YouTube views, citywide media coverage, it was, I, I think they did just a wonderful job. This is a great example. Yeah. I just keep thinking about getting my dollar and how I would have bragged to everybody and basically told them I got it from McDonald's, so the psychological <laughs> suggestion of repeating McDonald's to my friends all day would have some impact or driver yeah. take me to McDonald's, I think. Um, yep. I think the other neat thing about this project was um, – probably, John, what you'll address in our next slide here, but where it's ice, it's not a tangible thing where you have stuck something to a pole and you might get in trouble with the authorities. The ice melts and there's money on the ground. There's not a lot of people who are going to get upset with that, and so it was a clever way to dodge it, um, some of the risk factors. Um, exactly. But, John, why don't you uh, introduce your example here and tell us about some of those issues? Yeah, so Phil gave an example of, a, of something that should be emulated. This is one that, again, I, I don't think those that thought of this idea and actually promoted this idea thought through all the ramifications and the potential uh, not-so-positive things that could occur because of this. So basically, this is uh, – it was an adult swim um, campaign. They were, they were launching a new Aqua Teen season on uh, – Cartoon Network. If you're familiar with that, it, at nighttime, Cartoon Network turns into Adult Swim, which is more of an adult type of, of programming. Now, this was targeted just around the Boston area, um, and it dealt with these LED signs. They kind of look like, if you're old enough, you might remember Night Brights or, or something similar, or 8-bit video games, if you're as old as I am. Um, this is what these look like. But um, the timing, the, this is the concern here, is they understood their audience, what would resonate with them, but I think their fatal flaw was really the timing around this because it was post 9-11, just not long after 9-11. And so walking around the city, if you weren't familiar with what this character was that looked like this night bright, you might think, gosh, you know, after all the things that happened with terrorism on 9-11, this could be something that uh, we, should, we, we should be concerned about. So you had a lot of people, just normal uh, common Joe citizens calling the police department saying, hey, we've got some pretty suspicious activity. These are starting to pop up all over the city. They're starting to glow. You know, could be potential bomb. Don't know what's going on. And so, of course, as you see in the, uh, in the image that was just shown, 
you had a lot of bomb squads taking this off of off of roofs and off of different installations that were made. So to your point, Dustin, yeah, this wasn't something that eventually over time melted or was gone or uh, you wouldn't have any issues potentially with uh, with the local authorities. This is something that really uh, came back and hit them hard. And because of that, that um, it got their message across, but probably not in the way that they had hoped. Right. Well, and, uh, some later reports did say that they saw great results uh, going to the Adult Swim, um, but at the consequence, I believe um, Turner Media had to pay um, a significant amount back to the city. Fine. And so uh, right. I think we use right. this example not to scare anybody out there, but just to really drive that um, drive it home that you, you need to be careful with this stuff. Um, here are just a few other miscellaneous examples, a uh, little bit more low-budget stuff. We talked about some big brands right there. Um, but on the side is YKM. They're a fitness uh, company, and it's just a bag, and it has a drawstring, and the drawstring looks like a jump rope. Um, the upper right one is a great idea for uh, another way to do just a really cheap but uh, memorable thing. And so they're giving away free air guitars. Um, I think that's hilarious. And then the last one is, takes a little bit more of an investment, but also just a great idea. And you see a lot of guerrilla marketing at bus stops, on buses. Um, but this one is actually a, um, a fitness, not a fitness, but like a health company. And they were trying to fight obesity. And so when you actually sat down on the bench, it would show you how, many, how much you weighed. This is a European campaign, and so I believe it's in kilos. But um, a little awkward for people to maybe sit there, but how memorable would that be if you, if you got weighed right in front of everybody? Um, those are a few other examples. Do you guys have any examples you want to bring up off the top of your heads? Or should we go to the next? You know, I, th I think we've covered quite a few good ones. I think uh, I, I personally like to jump into the yeah, into the Let's ones that might them. pertain most to, to our audience, yeah. Sure. And so as we said, for those of you who uh, stuck around, we, we picked three um, attendees, companies, and we went ahead and tried to put some different guerrilla marketing uh, activities that we might suggest you guys uh, go into. And so... The first is a financial services company, and they do transportation factoring. Um, I actually have a history at England Logistics, which owns its own factoring company, and so I was interested to, to go after this one myself. But um, just to identify the audience, oftentimes in transportation factoring, it can be both a B2B, where you are going to a... Um, a truck owner who has multiple trucks, and so he actually has a full business going, or B2C where you have an owner-operator and they're running their own company, and more or less it's a, a consumer play. And so um, just kind of thinking about trucks being out on the road, and for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with what tr factoring is, it's, it's kind, of, um, kind of like a bill pay program where you can submit your invoices and a financial company will pay them, and so you don't have to wait the 30, 60, even 90 days that uh, companies often have to pay or wait until uh, they get their invoices back. But as you can imagine, a truck needs gas right away, so if they don't have the cash flow, they're not going to be running. And so um, we thought a couple of the good avenues that might be used for this were viral, street, and ambient. And just a few of the freebie ideas we, we wanted to talk about is the truck wrap, uh, you see that image over there on the right. Um, I'm sure this financial services co uh, company wants to know if I, I'm worth my salt, and I do know that's a European truck, but I thought that Mars image was pretty neat anyway. Um, so those are some fantastic ideas, and you could do the same thing with some type of a money image or something. And then you have a moving billboard. Um, they're actually very cost-effective, and they get seen wherever the – truck is going, it stops at all the truck stops, so people are constantly seeing. Uh, so that was one of our kind of freebie ideas. Um, the, the other was many money checkbooks in place of mailers. John talked about this. Rather than sending, you know, uh, a cheap 
flyer out that you send to everybody, why don't you do a little bit more of a targeted play to some of your low-hanging fruit and send them a money checkbook or just something that's a little bit more fun, sits on their desk and uh, gives you great brand awareness and eventually uh, has a great call to action as well. And then the last one uh, we thought would be fun was a loyalty tag campaign. Transportation factoring really benefits from loyalty programs because all the drivers are, um, it's kind of um, one of those recommendation type industries where you drive and you trust your friends. And so uh, we think it'd be fun if you actually had a game of tag going where a driver could actually earn a loyalty point for tagging somebody and you could actually have some type of product that they could put on the truck um, so that you knew that truck had been tagged. Um, so those are a few just kind of random ideas we thought for the transportation factoring uh, um, attendee that we have on today. Do you guys have anything to add to those with this client specifically? No, that, that sounds great. I, uh, I mean, it would be fun to continue the concept and brainstorm on it, but I, I think that's an excellent start. Yep. Um, so hopefully some food for thought there. Another one of our uh, attendees today was uh, a, an applied technology school. Phil or John, do you want to take this? Or you want me to go ahead? Um, I'm happy to jump into this. Uh, I've spent considerable time um, on uh, on working with a lot of the uh, local Applied Technology Council uh, schools in town, as well as the UCOT, the overall brand. And uh, you know, as we kind of think about how do we promote specific, and so rather than just promote the school, what's interesting with an Applied Technology College is we can actually get to more of a personal type level. So, you know, you might be trying to become a dental hygienist, you might be trying to earn a nursing degree, you might be trying to become a welder, you know, mechanic, et cetera. And so there's a lot of interesting things you can do because we can be so specific and recruit just to the enrollment that we need for the, you know, classes, coursework, programs, upcoming. And so because of that, it lends itself to a nice B2C campaign, of course, going after consumers, those that are either you know, maybe not be not in the career that they want to be or looking to kind of uh, improve in those situations in a B2C play. Uh, but uh, from as far as avenues of choice, you know, viral, street, ambush, ambient, and stealth uh, all kind of fit well uh, within this kind of mantra. You can see the, the picture off to the right, just kind of that is fun, talking about ballet and immediately thinking of a tutu and how, you know, individuals can relate to that uh, quite easily. Again, I think that works well, at least visually. You just want to make sure that uh, you're not going to get in uh, too much trouble, you know, as a uh, applied technology college and putting up things on polls, you know, without getting permission or at least make sure it's acceptable in that city. Um, and, and so, again, we could have some fun uh, as far as some of these freebie ideas, uh, fun with the education components of talking about the technical college overall, you know, large pencils and landmarks in that area as they often will serve specific geographical ranges. You know, you are here, you could be there, and uh, being able to kind of draw attention to that. People thinking of, you know, pencils and pens as far as coursework and school goes. Uh, they've done, I know that I've seen a lot of the applied technology colleges around here locally that do a lot with bus stops, or at least with buses, and that some of that environmental advertising uh, but you could have a lot, a lot of fun with that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think as people think of bus stops and, and, and as you're there and there's benches, just like we showed in that weight example, um, you know, showing somebody's weight in kilos, you could have a lot of fun where you almost could make it look like people were sitting or gathering or congregating around this bus stop or bench, um, but with kind of those, you know, messages or you know, kind of on them with a message, you know, such as classes are for everybody. And so people can of all breaths, and that's really what a lot of the applied technology schools are trying to preach is that, you know, applied technologies could be for anyone. So whether it's teenagers dress certain ways or adults or, uh, you know, those in nurses or cooks or mechanics, et cetera, but just being able to get that message out and do it uh, in the, kind of that guerrilla fashion with some environmental signage there. And, um, this last one in regards to, uh, you know, Mother's Day, uh, to have a little bit of fun with that, you know, delivering roses for Mother's Day, maybe doing it away and partnering up with a local florist and uh, helping them see you could target, 
demographically, you know, single mothers who often need to come back to school. And again, both an appreciation type campaign to mothers and kind of giving them a tribute and also to say, um, you know, here are some roses, uh, you know, come learn how to, et cetera, and being able to uh, you know, help them expand on their gifts and talents. But I think that's a nice play to, you know, kind of reach a, a single mother's audience potentially or low-income families that, uh, you know, could be of uh, great benefit there. I'll, I'll add one thing, Phil. You did a, a great job describing all that. One thing that I've seen in action a lot, actually we're working with a client right now in the nonprofit space, to uh, it's specifically addiction recovery. But again, as we talk about ambient guerrilla marketing, it's using, using things that are out in, in nature or in the wild or in our environment anyway. And one of those things that you often see is staircases. And when you're trying to help people move from one situation to another or improve in their life, whether it be school with education, you can obviously use stairs in multiple different ways. Um, again, working with addiction recovery or with school or whatever, you, you are here, you want to be here. How do you get there? We often talk about multiple steps having to be taken. It's both literal and figurative, but you can do a lot of fun things around steps. And Dustin, to your point, um, you know, with ice, you don't have an issue because eventually it melts and, and uh, no one can come after you. Well, with steps, you can often use chalk or do something there and um, make a social play off that, a social media play, and, and really have a lot of impact that way. Yeah, very good. And I will uh, just preface, I think we do recognize that uh, applied tech schools do have a B2B play with uh, getting some of the business education um, uh, and like certificates and whatnot, but we kind of wanted to focus here on the B2C end of it. Let's go to our last example here. And uh, one of our attendees was actually a medical um, hearing devices. Um, they did hearing aids. And so again, uh, kind of a B2C and a B2B play. Um, B2C, obviously direct to consumer, and then B2B could potentially be any type of uh, hearing office uh, that they might be able to resell through. And so um, obviously avenues of choice would be viral, street, and ambient again. Um, and just a couple thoughts we had were to put out a large ear bone at the local shopping mall that says something really quietly such that you can't hear or if you have good hearing you can hear it, um, but that it just says it so quietly and then on it, it says something about if you have the right hearing aid, you could turn it up and you could actually hear this. And so I think just the noise would have a natural draw effect and it's almost annoying. And so it kind of has that disruptive factor to it. But when you read it, it's a little bit clever as well. And so that's a, a good way. And, and in the shopping mall, um, oftentimes they'll, they'll allow these things. And if not, it doesn't cost too much for you to get into a shopping mall where you have a lot of, um, uh, uh, you do have a, a midday older crowd there, and so this could be a great audience for you and or even for others who might purchase this product on behalf of others. Um, the last one we had here was for uh, the B2B side of things was to send them things like speakers or other clever promotional tools. Um, there's a million really, really affordable uh, speakers that are actually quite good now. And uh, again, we keep saying this, but just send things to targeted audiences that are of more value than just a piece of paper, and they just have such a greater effect than sending that, that, that document everybody just throws away. So, Anybody have anything else on this one? No, I, uh, I like both of those examples. Excellent. Well, um, we're, we're definitely uh, a little bit over time here, uh, but John, Phil, do you guys want to lead us out and just give us a quick summary um, of what you think the most important parts of guerrilla marketing are? You know, I'll start and I'll let John close, but, you know, just thinking of that, again, guerrilla marketing mindset more than anything is to say what type of high-impact exposure activities could we do, and again, traditionally around an event and unveiling a new campaign, a kickoff, complementing often sometimes other uh, more traditional or integrated type of marketing advertising. And so, you know, considering kind of a low-budget originality and, again, getting people's attention, uh, you got to be careful where it's not overly provocative uh, or sends the wrong message, but in a way where you begin to get people think and especially experience your brand, uh, even albeit on the street or elsewhere. 
Uh, and the only other thing I would, um, would have you consider is translating everything we just talked about to a digital sense is to say what type of guerrilla marketing will we begin to see online digitally? Because I think, you know, as people engage more and more with brands digitally, how, how do we still kind of create, so to speak, this type of guerrilla marketing as people are potentially leaving their homes less and not community as much or not outside as much? Is there still some creative high-impact ways to do that um, and uh, be able to kind of, so to speak, hijack an experience that they're having uh, in a real positive brand experience. So, Yeah, that's great, Phil. I, I totally agree with everything you said, and specifically as you talk about digital. And as we think about Gorilla, Gorilla, if I were to distill it down into its basic essence, I would call it you're trying to create a message or tell a story that inspires or impacts people, pulls on the heartstrings, draws emotion out, does something, so that they react in a certain way and they become the broadcaster for your message. Whether that broadcaster be uh, the end consumer, you know, which we know the end consumer's voice with social media now is much uh, broader than it used to be. They can impact multiple hundreds and thousands of people just individually now. But also those broadcasters could be traditional. Um, but really you're just trying to, to create a message which entertains, educates, informs, does something that is memorable so that, again, that message is amplified through these broadcasting stations. I think that's the core essence. And, again, in today's digital era, we can do that much more easy than we used to do in the past. So that's, I think, the key essence and the crux of guerrilla marketing. Now, thanks for joining us today on this webinar. So I uh, appreciate you, John, um, participating and hosting with us. And, uh, we certainly appreciate uh, the ideas and uh, the concepts that, that you also brought today. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, before I let you two go, um, and for those still left on, Sean, if you do have 10 minutes, we do have a few questions. Bill, do you guys uh, both have a time to just answer a couple of these questions? Sure. Of course. Okay. All right. Um, give me one sec. I'll get pulled up here. Okay, so our first question was, uh, guerrilla marketing is supposed to be low budget, but many companies go all out on big budget. Is it possible to have an impression on a smaller budget? John, do you want to take that in the nonprofit you, realm? <laughs> you, you betcha. You betcha. As we know, specifically in the nonprofit realm, um, budget is usually a, a large concern. And I would say, yes, it's definitely possible. And... Oftentimes, it's these get, that get the most pick, uh, pick up, I would say, um, from their campaigns that they do. Because um, I think sometimes these large broadcasters, specifically traditional media broadcasters, kind of sniff through some of the stuff that companies might be doing. But when it's a nonprofit, it, it looks more altruistic in what they're trying to do. So I think the key here, as with, I think, the majority of all marketing campaigns, is in the creative and in the creative execution. So if you have a good idea, a big idea that um, is going to take you places, I don't care if you're Coca-Cola or if you're the, the nonprofit around the corner that really has no marketing budget, it'll, it'll go places. One of the key things here, too, is to, again, tell your message and tell your story in such a way that it resonates with people and find those key distribution points that you want to pick that up and have a, have a game plan to – to uh, let them know what you're doing. Again, it can be as overt as hiring a marketing or a PR firm to help you get your message out, which again seems to me like a little bit more disingenuous. Or maybe it's just making sure that a key individual is aware of what you're doing and once that individual is aware and they understand what you're trying to do, they will amplify that for you. So again, you can either go through the traditional uh, ways to broadcast that message, or in today's digital world, social media world, you can find people that will get behind your message quite easily and, and really blow that up for you. I, I completely agree. And, um, you know, I also think people look at guerrilla marketing and they think it has to be a big project. But 
I feel that guerrilla marketing is a great tactic that you can take into a, a single traditional event, such as a conference or something. And rather than getting out the normal table and booth and whatnot, you come up with something a little bit more clever and interactive. Uh, you can do guerrilla marketing tactics right there. Uh, oftentimes, even just outside of the convention halls, and so I think people could, you don't have to think that it's a huge, you know, statewide, nationwide, full audience kind of a thing, but pick a direct audience you think you can have an impact and start with a small budget there, and I think you'd find success as well. Great answers, guys. Um, let's take the next question. I think we've uh, answered this one a little bit, but maybe we can expand here. Does the rise of social media make it easier to use guerrilla marketing? Is there a way to use social media in combination with guerrilla marketing? You know, I, I'd, love to start take, off? Yeah, I'd love to take that one. There's an organization we're working with right now that, as you think about trending topics on Twitter or social media and often that hashtag, I, I, I think, you know, being able to create a hashtag that can have an impact both on and offline is uh, an excellent way to kind of tie the two together. I think social, it only helps proliferate the impact of guerrilla marketing in a couple of ways. Number one, people taking pictures and sharing photos with their friends on social platforms and allowing them to quickly get out the message. I mean, think about the McDonald's example, how many people would want to take a picture of that? I mean, how often do you see, you know, $4,000 in, you know, in the shape of, an, of a McDonald's arch in an ice block? I mean, how cool and memorable that is. So instantly everybody wants to share it, and that's then shared, you know, virally to the news sites, blogs, et cetera. Uh, but secondly, I think you can even play in where there is this idea of a guerrilla campaign with an environmental type approach, you know, or even ambient, but then being able to pull that into social, being able to hashtag that. And as people do post, that they can begin to uh, help, ag you know, aggregate uh, multiple postings and begin to see this as, uh, you know, bigger than just a single event and even go beyond your reach. You know, if you can get uh, several hundred people to post pictures of themselves with the coolness factor, uh, not only, of course, to their audience has seen it giving a bigger impact, but it potentially allows you to kind of take advantage of uh, larger discussions or topics that are happening around the country. Yeah, I would, I would agree 100% with Phil. Um, and I think the power, true power of social media is the fact it's not going from an institution to an individual, but rather individual to individual. Um, so as all of us know, you can promote a tweet as an institution or as a brand, but that is by far not as effective as having someone see a, an image like with the McDonald arches up in Canada or something associated with a hashtag that they then see coming from their friends' feed. So I, I totally agree. Social media is huge in the guerrilla marketing landscape of today. I would uh, second that, and I think uh, that cooler is the best part of the whole statement there. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's what it's all about. Um, our last question uh, this is actually a great question here. Uh, isn't achieving guerrilla marketing success just as hard as making something go viral? How can we help make sure our guerrilla campaign has success? Uh, I'll let either one of you go first on that. You know, I, I don't mind starting. So, again, as we talked about some of those kind of key points of beginning with an objective and a target audience, and I would almost say you can kind of, as John talked about, worst case scenario, say if we at least achieve this benchmark, of success, even though it's maybe not to where we want to be, but to set an expectation to say, can we orchestrate our efforts to at least achieve this? And with that, being able to then help you, you know, I, I think you can make sure that you win there because if you can be at an event or in a public place or a setting, and if you've tested and vetted this idea enough and it has that aha moment or cool factor, you know, for, for you to say, look, if we can at least get 100 people to stop or 200 people to stop, I would, you know, set expectations in line to know it would be great if we had 10,000 people see this or stop or interact with it. That probably won't happen, but let's at least make sure that we orchestrate success with this experience. And, you know, because we know that there's going to be these types of people at this time of day, you know, during these days of the week in this location, we know we're at least going to kind of 
environmentally affect and be able to impact them. And so you could even scope out where is it we're going to do this, what will this look like, and begin to know and even do some people counting and to at least make sure that the impact, one with the intended audience, that potentially can drive sales and, um, you know, new customer acquisition. But secondly, you know, that it is in a high traffic area enough that it would have an acceptable kind of a, a minimum impact. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with all that, Phil. And that, that for me, I, I actually consider viral marketing almost a subset of, of guerrilla marketing. So I appreciate that question. I think uh, whoever asked that was pretty astute. There, there is a close association between the two. And just, a, again, with any good marketing campaign, if you begin with the end in mind, if you know what you want to accomplish, uh, I think you have to uh, sometimes, as we all know, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. And especially if, if people are just dipping their foot into the pool of guerrilla marketing, they've got to expect to learn quite a bit but right before they see these, these big wins. I think the best way to go about it, quite honestly, is to look at the anatomy of the best guerrilla marketing tactics. Specifically, if you can get them within your industry, within your vertical, you'll be able to see what people have done, maybe some common themes and elements, why they were successful, Maybe find those ones that weren't successful and what happened there. But I, I think the key thing is to start with experience, begin, try it out, talk to people, see what has worked for them. Um, again, look at the anatomy of what's worked in the past and what hasn't, and really just start the best way possible. But understand that you've got to, you've got to put yourself out there to really, to really make a difference. You've got to start. Well, I think that's fantastic, uh Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. That has to be the mantra of all digital marketing, I would think, huh? You um, bet you fail, fail fast, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> Those are some great comments. Um, I think, uh, you know, everything that has been said here is just uh, perfectly on point. Um, we, I don't have any other questions at this time, and uh, we've gone a little bit overboard, so I will once again extend my appreciation and thank you on behalf of uh, Myself and the team here at Fluid, uh, to you, or John, um, John Dye from uh, Boncom, thank you for everything that you shared with us today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you being here. Okay. We'll okay. see you. Thank you, Phil. Have a good day. Thanks to all our attendees. Uh, you guys can follow us on Fluid Webinar Series. Uh, everybody have a great day.